turn my mic up. Boy, yo. Take there. Yeah, yeah, uh, on the road to the riches. Life takes a toll like bridges. Good friends become foes and snitches. Better watch who knows in your business. Shaquana Teasley. Hello, hello, hello. How are you today, miss? I am great. Honored to be here. So, Hustle Fam, Hustle Fam, we have a, a different show today. Um, you know, I think typically in logistics, we have an extremely narrow scope of what logistics is, right? And the opportunities that exist in the space. You know, Shaquana, so I, I wanted to bring you on to drop some jewels today and open some people's minds um, to global logistics, right? International trade, um, that's what you do, right? Agate Solutions is the name of your company? Correct. Um, and you have a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience, and a long list of credentials, <laughs> right? right? So, so you, need, you need to, it's, it's, it, it, you have to talk to the people. Like, we got to get you on <laughs> the stage to talk to the people because it's detrimental um, to us to learn this information. I mean, even, you know, in just kind of studying what you do, I'm learning new things every day. Wow. So um, it's awesome. So first of all, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate the privilege. For sure. All right. So let's start from the beginning, Shaquana, because there's a backstory to how you got into this world of international trade and global logistics. So let's really start from the beginning. Talk about it. Where are you from? Let, let, let's, let's get into the story. All right. So my name is Shaquana Teasley. I'm known in my industry as Shaq, Shaq Attack, to the people that know how I really get down in mm. customs compliance. So I'm from Brooklyn, New York, bed to be exact, born and raised, did all my education in, you know, in the five boroughs. I was fortunate enough to get three degrees for free. Every job that I worked, you know, I went in and said, I know you're not really paying me much. Can you pay for me to get a degree? And they will always be skeptical, but I think they didn't think I would actually take them up on the offer. <laughs> right. Uh, so I've probably gotten over $300,000 in education. I was able to get my associates, my bachelor's, and then my master's, and then multiple certifications. And I thank God for that opportunity and the blessing. Uh, so I've been doing this now for approximately 17 years. I specialize in international trade and global logistics. I've done both. Uh, when I first started my education, I actually was a social worker in New York. Okay. I was a social worker for about five years. I did domestic violence. I did uh, foster care. I did substance abuse. I worked halfway homes, and I did that for a really long time throughout the five boroughs. Uh, and that's really where my heart is at. So okay. my heart, my passion is service because I just feel like uh, we're an underserved community. And oftentimes people either don't reach back or nobody's even knowing that we exist. Therefore, we find ourselves not having the same opportunities that really are readily available. We just don't know how to get to them. Got you. So I did social work for a long time. I relocated from New York down to Atlanta. I was there for 9-11, another story, mm. a very rough time, uh, still rough to talk about at times. Uh, but that made me want to see what was outside of New York after, the, after that traumatic event. My brother was already in the Atlanta area. I came to visit and just decided I'm going to pack up and move. Gotcha. Being from New York, I wasn't even a driver. <laughs> I didn't even drive. I didn't have a license. Right. I went back, got a license. Uh, I bought an 88 Camry from my next door neighbor. And uh, he was like, you need a muffler. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I literally got in the car and drove to Atlanta. Okay. Okay. Got here and social work was uh, well-defined in a whole nother aspect. Uh, I would have been responsible for not just the metro area, but the suburbs as well. I had to have a certain type of vehicle. The pay was like $20,000 less. And I was like, wow, so I need a whole new career. I always thought I would be a social worker. What am I going to do? Right. I went to a temp agency and I said, hey, give me any job. I just moved here a few weeks ago. I need anything. And she said, okay. She said, well, what's your, what's your degrees? We'll find you something. Three weeks passed, and she called me back, and she said, no one's calling you, and I think it's because of your name. Right. Wow. I said, really? She was like, yeah, we, there's not many Shaquanas, and you just don't want to be that here. Mm. And I said, where I come from, that's not uncommon. I can't be Shaquana. She was like, no, ma'am. You sure can't? And I said, so, okay. She said, well, I'm going to change your name on your resume. I'll call you when you get a hit. So I'm like, well, what I'm going to be? What, what, what name I'm going to be, which was so weird for me, right? My family is very cultural. My father is a former Black Panther, uh, civil rights movement, uh, very much power to the people. So mm. I was like, oh, man, I can't tell my father. They about to change my name, right? Right. Uh, so long story short, she called me back and said, you got a hit at Yellow Freight, uh, Yellow Railway Trucking Company. And she said, but your name is Shay. 
And I said, Shay? <laughs> I said, why gotta be Shay? She said, oh, that's a pleasant name. People love one syllable name, just catchy. I was like, okay, I gotta be Shay. So she said, your interview is tomorrow morning. Look professional. You're gonna be a front desk clerk. I'm like, front desk? I'm from Brooklyn. I'm not front desk. I was like, I'm, like, I'm not front desk. Please don't make me front desk. She was like, oh, you have the look. I have the look. Okay. So I can't be Shaquana, but apparently I have a look. So I was being stereotyped, and I had not been used to that. Where I came from, it was many Shaquanas. Many people looked like me. Uh, I came here, and that was not the case. And that was, that was in about 2004. Right. Got to the interview. I'm sitting there with other people. You know how many times they called Shay and I never answered? <laughs> End of the day, they came out like, okay, we're done with interviews. Ma'am, I'm sorry, who are you here to see? And I was like, I'm here for the interview for front desk clerk. She's like, hey, who, what's your name? And I was like, oh. She's like, are you Shay? I was like, I'm Shay. Right, 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 like, oh, right. I forgot I'm supposed to be Shay. Yeah. Anyway, they interviewed me and they said, oh, you had the look for the front desk. You had the look. I said, okay. So I got the job on the spot, started the next week. It was hot. It was so hot. I mean, you guys, hot. It's hot in Atlanta. Right. And I had not ever experienced this type of heat without having nearby water or the large buildings for shade. It was right. really hot. So by the time I started the next week, I got my hair braided to keep it off my neck. And it was like, it'll be braided for the summer. I don't have to worry about it. And all of a sudden, I didn't have to look anymore. Mm. And I was like, she was like, oh, are you going to look urban all the time? Urban. So what urban means? I said, oh, I'm urban. I'm from the city. Right. Right? She was like, they all looked at each other. And she's like, okay, you can stay like this for the first day. But I had on full business attire, pumps. And I did. I truly did not get it. Right? And yeah. I always prided myself in being very well-spoken and articulate. So I've never had an issue with being able to express myself well in any culture. So I was like, is it the way I'm speaking? Is it too fast? Do I sound too New York? I never thought in a million years it was my braids until... Uh, the end, you know, our braids for us stay in for like the month. <laughs> right, right, right. At the end of the week, she just came to me and was like, okay, you have the weekend to change back to how we met you. And I was like, please, just give it to me straight. I'm not doing a good job of reading between the lines. And she said, the coils in your hair. I was like, coils? The braids? She was like, yes, please. I was like, oh, man, I paid like $200 to get my hair braided. She wanted out. It's hot. And... Uh, my, I mean, I've always been able to sit on my hair. It's always been that long. And I'm like, man, I can't survive in Atlanta like this. But anyway, I was like, well, I need a job. What I'm going to do? I went home, took my braids out, came back with this bun. And a guy from Miami approached me. He said, hey, I'm going to just give it to you straight. You're not going to make it here hmm. at the front desk. They don't like you. He was like, your culture just way too thick for the South. So I'm going to bring you in the back terminal with me. And I'm 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 gonna teach you something different. I said I don't want a CDL. I am not driving a truck. He was like, No, 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 no. We're gonna get someone else for the front desk, and I'm just gonna move you to the back. I'm like, Okay. He took me to the back, and he started teaching me the export documentation to export freight to the Caribbean. And I said, But it's a trucking company. He was like, No, we're actually a freight forwarder as well. We only do exports to the Caribbean. He was like, And after I'm done with you, you'll never look for a job again in your life. Mm. And I'm like, At a trucking company? But he was so cool. So he literally taught me export documentation. When, and I tell people, don't ever shy from learning paperwork. Because pay, every field of a piece of paper teach you some type of law or what governs that box, right? The box represents something. So I became intrigued, like, what this box mean? Why am I putting this data element in these fields? And he just sat down with me and taught me it all from scratch. Yellow acquired roadway, and they began to let go all temporary employees. And I said, well, I've been here over a year. I need medical benefits. You know, I, I got to find something else. This is, you know, I have all this education. What am I going to do? Right. And he said, well, I want you to meet my wife and we're going to help you. We're going to teach you and show you what type of jobs you qualify for now. So I still didn't even know my value. I didn't really know what to even apply for. And he and his wife, they were retiring. He said, I'm going to retire. We got to get you out of here before this acquisition, acquisition is done and I'll help you find jobs. And he was literally helping me understand what I qualified for. Uh, I was very grateful for that, always will be. Uh, that landed me a position at a chemical company, mm. a, global footprint, a global footprint. They had an office in every major continent. I took the job there as a logistics analyst, so they taught me import and export. 
the great part about that was I got to sit down and actually sit in the meetings in the rooms with global freight negotiations. Okay. So how do we negotiate freight on the ocean? How do we negotiate freight to go via air, rail, and truck? Uh, I was very fortunate also because it was a chemical company I learned hazmat. So I, I got certified in hazardous material by every mode of transportation. So mm. air, ocean, rail, road. But I've never been in a truck in my life. Hmm. So I would certify the placards that go on the trucks. Right. I would certify the packages and the dangerous good documents to say what was explosive, what was flammable, what was an oxidizer, etc. Uh, so I'm the weird person on the road on a road trip with my family, and they're playing punch buggy, no punch back. <laughs> Not me. I'm like, you know what that package? You pointing is? things out. I'm gonna talk about like, yeah, that truck. That's explosive. Right, right, right. <laughs> no doubt, no so doubt. So I'm that one in, in, on the road trip, right? So everybody finds it funny, like, mom, what that means? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So I got, I got to learn that, and then I was doing global logistics, and I had to specialize in seasons. Chinese New Year, which for the Chinese culture would be Spring Festival. I had to become quickly culturally uh, an expert in culture so that I didn't offend the other cultures. Mm. And that's how I got my name Shaq. Mm. So Simplified I had, it. I had a team in China that reported to me. Okay. And they had adopted American names because their names were difficult to pronounce for American. Right. right. They're like David and Michael, but their name is like Chin. What was <laughs> right. Some, some, right, right, right. right. And what, you know what was really funny? They had taken names from movies. So the guy I worked with the most, his name was Jackie Chan. <laughs> And I, all this time, like a crazy person, I really thought that was his name. So I used to meet with them at night all the time yeah. because of the time difference. Yeah. And one evening, I said, he was the one that spoke English the best. So I said, Jackie, you guys never call me Shaquana ever, right? right? And he said, oh, in my culture, Q-U is C, and it doesn't make sense for us. Right. So we, we just can't get those syllables out. And I was like, oh. So he said, we have American names for you. I said, oh, so you want me to have a Chinese name? He said, no, just something one syllable. So I said, you have an American name? He was like, yeah, I'm Jackie Chan. <laughs> I was like, oh, Jackie Chan the movie? <laughs> oh, he was my like, God. yes, Jackie Chan the movie. Yeah. So anyway, uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, they asked me if I would take on Shaq because Shaquille O'Neal was their, famous ba their favorite basketball that's, that's player. Funny. And, that's funny. And they, and they was like, we call him the beast in the paint. Okay. You know, he's, you know, yeah, he's yeah, a yeah. center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he can play center. He's so For big. Sure. And they was like, you're a beast in global logistics. <laughs> I was like, yes, I am Shaq forever <laughs> in this industry. So right. I took on Shaq. I loved it way more than Shay, of course. Yeah. I got to actually have some say in that. I loved it. So I became Shaq immediately, and I had people that reported to me in other countries, and they loved Shaq. It was easy for them. The French as well had a hard time with that. Mm. Uh, and Francois, which I thought had so many syllables, was like, no, we like Shaq too. Can we use that? Right, right, right. It just became my name. All Got my business you. cards became Shaq. My emails became Shaq. And I just became Shaq. And I, and I really enjoyed it. Mm. Uh, I was very fortunate during the time that I worked for this chemical company because not only did I become an expert in hazardous material, I became an expert freight negotiator in every mold in every country, major continent. So I began to negotiate freight to get on rail, road, over the air, over the ocean with other cultures right and that's difficult because you have to be sensitive to these cultures for instance they would come visit and I had to study what they would eat in regard to temperature control uh, it's insulting to serve someone from far east asia a cold temperature drink mm. or, or a sandwich wow a cold sandwich okay it's considered a sign of uh, insensitivity to their culture because they don't consume uh, high temperature cold temperature uh, liquids or meats wow I didn't know that, but I had to now train myself on right. what would be respectful. So they would come visit, and I would wait till the Yankees or the Mets was in Atlanta, and then take them to a game. <laughs> <laughs> no so doubt, we, we would be the ones right, right, right. All the Mets gear, yeah, all the Yankees yeah. gear. Kill two birds with one stone, right? right? Like, we won't come to Atlanta. Right. We won't rap New York. No doubt, no doubt, no question. <laughs> Which was funny, right? For them, it was yeah. very funny for them. Like, oh, we're gonna be New York and Atlanta. <laughs> okay, but they just roll with it, right? Right. right. And I would get them all the gear from home so they can represent. They're totally confused. <laughs> By, right. by the time people ask something like we we don't know we, we just we, we just, just put on up. what right we just showed up we, we just with her. <laughs> we just with her exactly right? we, we were Shaq we were the beast right. <laughs> and they would do that all 
the time. She had to be, especially when we would get high volume contracts mm-hmm. to move huge amount of freights during. Uh, we did a lot of pool chemicals, so we would move freight during the time that most people thought was slow season. Okay. Right. So when people say slow season to me, I don't get that. There's never a slow season globally. You just need to know how to position yourself for what's in season for another country and where what port that comes into our country. Truckers should never have a dry run. Right. Never. They right. should never have idle time. Mm. Uh, if you're strategically preparing yourself for what is seasonal and what the statistics and the data shows for where you should position your drivers and not only rely on load boards, you'll be successful. It's really that simple. Uh, otherwise, you're kind of running aimless, if that makes sense. Right, right, yeah. right. So a few things I want to unpack and kind of touch on because that's a dope story, but I got to go back. Let's, ro- okay, let's, let's rewind back. a little let's bit. So first, it's amazing to me that you said this was 2004? Correct. That the, the, the woman at the front desk or whatever would actually have the gall to part her lips and say these things to you. Like, I, I'm just trying to figure out what time are we living in? I'm, I'm trying to go back in my mind 16 years and like, were people st- acting like that 16 oh, years I, ago? I, here, that was my experience. And that was in Marietta, so that wasn't far from the city of Atlanta. Yeah, I mean, to really just say that to you blatantly, I mean, that must, I, I, I could imagine that must have really been a shock to you. It was shock. It was disappointing. And then I think that was the first time in my life that I realized uh, Shaquana was not acceptable. Right, right. I was like, I didn't, no one's ever had an issue with my name ever. And then not even the name, but to go into your hair and the coils and she's trying to, you know, figure out her own way to explain. It's just crazy. I mean, it sounds like we're back in civil rights era. And you know what's (laughs) even more crazy? When I started at the chemical company, my first day when I got to my new cubicle, Shay was on my placard and my business card. I'm like, how do they know Shay? Yeah, right. I thought I got a new start. Right. So I remember going to HR and saying, hey, uh, I think there's a mistake. I'm Shaquana. Right. And she said, no, you're Shay. Right. And I said, she said, when I called to get your references, uh, the previous employer referred to you as Shay. Mm. And I said, oh, which is a nickname that they said, but that's not how I prefer to be called. And she said, well, you do know that you don't look like a Shaquana. <laughs> and she gave me the... <laughs> she gave you that, huh? And I was like, okay, this is still happening to me, right? Yeah. I was like, okay. So I said, well, I'll be in onboarding and orientation. Can we just change it before I get back? I don't want to be represented right. that way. Right, right. And she said... <laughs> uh, we've already printed everything, and your email address says Shay. Mm. As well. So pretty much she was telling me, you're going to be this, period. I only worked there for about six months or so, and my dad came to visit. And he said, I want to see where you work. I said, oh, no, we don't want to go there. Right, right, right. I'm on vacation. Right. You know, I'm buying a new house. Come see the new house. Right. right. He was like, no. For all I know, you got a local crack house. <laughs> I want to see what them degrees has done. Show me where you, I want to see where you work. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, all right. So I took him down there. We get there, I get him a visitor's badge. Everybody's walking by. Morning, Shay. Hey, Shay. Morning, Shay. Pop's he, looking at you like, who? The whole time, he's kind of like <laughs> looking around. That ain't my daughter. He said, I want to see where you sit. I said, just a cubicle. Yeah. I, I want to see where you sit. Yeah. So I take him to my area. I was the only person of color in the area yeah. uh, at all at the time. I take him over there. And my supervisor at the time comes out. And he goes, hey, Shay, I thought you was on vacation. And I said, no, but I'm leaving. Right. And my dad said, no, I don't think we've met. And, and I said, that's, that's my supervisor, that's my manager. So he said, oh, you got to, he said, oh, we love Shay. She had such a bubbly personality. She brings so much high energy to the office and went to shake my dad's hand. And he said, we don't know Shay. Mm. I have never heard Shay in my life. That's what I'm talking about. Can I speak about. to you privately? That's what I'm talking I'm like, about. So I thought I was living a Friday episode. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yo, I'm about to get fired on my day off. I'm like, yo, this is a whole Friday episode. Right, right, right. right. I'm like, I'm about to get fired on my day off. Right. I finally got benefits. Yeah. And I'm doing well here. I'm buying a whole house. Went in the office and... Uh, I'm pretty outgoing, as you can see. Yeah, so yeah. for the first time, I really felt like just sit down and be quiet somewhere. Yeah. And I sat there like, you know, I was really humble. I let my dad do what he do. And my dad said, do you understand what Shaquana means, what that represents? That's an African problem. But we will not strip my daughter of her culture. Not at this organization. Not in the South. We just not doing that. Mm. So why are you calling her that? I need to understand. We don't even know anyone named Shay. So he said, I don't know. She came to me like that. He was like, you don't like that? And I said, no. And I asked him not to call me that. He said, who's them? I'm like, oh. 
because the person was a vice president of our human resource department. Right. And I was like, I'd rather not say who. And he said the name straight up. Was it so and so? So my dad was like, can I, can I speak to this person? Right, right. He was like, there's no need. He was like, Shaq, you know what? No, at the time, he was still calling me Shay. My dad said, no, we're not going to be calling her that. Yeah. Shaquana. Yeah. He was like, okay, Shaquana, uh, take, finish off the rest of your vacation. I'll have everything changed by the time you come back. Mm. And he did. So when I came back, I knew I had this big presentation to show the freight lanes I had just secured globally to move this very, 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 very nasty stuff. It was an oxidizer and a lot of ocean carriers just wouldn't allow it on their ships. And I had made such great relationships that I had actually gotten a Chinese owned vessel operating company to move the freight. Okay. So coming back, I couldn't wait to show everybody what I was able to accomplish in such a short amount of time. So what I did was, y'all gonna laugh. <laughs> what I did was I did my presentation and I changed my first slide and it said, allow me to reintroduce myself. Okay. From, you know, yeah, 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 of right, course. Right, so I was like, PSA. You know, oh, right, yeah. right. I was like, you know, Jay can reintroduce himself. We all can be reintroduced. I can ever change. Right. And I can ever be myself. Right, right, right. So I did a whole allow me to reintroduce myself. And the next slide said, my name is Sha Shaquana. Mm. And then within a few months of that is when the Chinese crew gave me the Shaq name. Wow, wow. That's dope. I love how your, 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 your dad understood the power of names. I mean, if you allow somebody to strip you of your name, Essentially, they're stripping you of everything that that name encompasses and who you are. What the, the gentleman that you spoke about who kind of was really responsible for kind of changing your life he in a did. direction. Yeah, what 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 attracted him to you? Why, why you? Why did he pick you out and what made him want to, you know, teach you what he taught you? So I'll never forget him. His name is Mike Law. Um, he said to me that he had never seen uh, anyone of color at the company at all that wasn't a driver or a dispatcher. Mm. And he was from Miami and where it was very culturally diverse. And they would make fun of my accent all the time and call me Yankee. And to me, of course, I didn't have an accent. Right. And they would they would be like, oil and car and coffee. And I'm like, that's funny. <laughs> like, you know, and I, I, I'm like, that's funny. Right, 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 right. So right, they right. would make fun of my accent all the time. And he, he didn't find it funny because he was different because he was from Miami and he had grew up in a very culturally enriched community, enriched community. And he felt like he had to protect me from uh, the culture of that company. He told me that. Got you. I love that. I love that. Now, you, you have several degrees, right? I do. All right. So let, let's talk about that. Your first degree was in what? My first degree was in liberal arts. I focused in social work. Okay. So you were focused in social work. And right. then you said when you were working, they sent you to school to get other degrees. Right. Can you talk about right. how that kind of right. kind of happened? Okay. So that happened in New York when I, so I moved out of my, I graduated high school and moved out of my mom's home the, the same week. So I turned 18, graduated high school and moved out all in five days. You were gone. Uh, yeah. I come <laughs> from a very large family. We lived in the projects, three bedrooms. So we was foot to toe in the bed. Right. Uh, I was the, in the middle, middle of that, of the large population of kids, eight of us. So my older siblings were already having their own children uh, by the time I was like 10 and so it was just a very cramped space uh, anybody that's from the projects can relate that I really felt like if I didn't leave it would be my life I felt like I was in a light a, a, a life or death situation okay uh, we was considered successful if we made it to the school down the street safely between the crackheads and the building and the shootouts etc right um, and I was surrounded by that and just even my family, a lot of my family members, you know, back and forth, visiting family in jail. And I truly believe a lot of them were really were products of their society and their environment because they had never seen anything else. That was what was the norm. Uh, so I felt like school would be the only way to save me. Like I had convinced myself if I go to college and I, you know, this going to sound crazy. I would watch a different world <laughs> and be like, if I be like them. Right. Could probably get out of the projects and get a good job. No doubt, no doubt. Right, no doubt. and nobody was really dreaming a big dream for me at the time. The dream was like, you can get a city job, you can be a train conductor, and you can apply for the projects, and you can get a pension, and you'll be straight for the rest of your for the straight for the rest of your life. Right. And um, so I had to I had to think bigger, right, than what was around. But I had nothing to really look at to show me something different. So I work, when I moved out, I was working retail jobs, Bad, Bed Bath & Beyond, Joyce Leslie, whatever store job. But then I took a job at an insurance company, literally pushing mail around the office. Okay. And the dad that I actually speak of is not my dad, my biological dad. The dad that I'm speaking of actually approached me at this insurance company. Okay. And he said, what are you doing here? Why are you not away at school? The interns don't start until the summer. 
And I'm like, why is he all up in my... <laughs> so I always was very, like, standoff. Yeah. And he would do that all the time. See me outside and be like, why, why are you not in college? So one day I just said to him, look, I don't have no parents to get me through school. There's no college for me. He was like, no, it is. If you're serious, I, if you're serious, I can get you to a college. Mm. He took me to the human resource department and said, hey, she pushed a mail for a cart around here. And uh, she about to turn 19. It got to be a scholarship or something. So they gave me an exam, right? And they said, well, if she could do medical billing and medical coding and pass this exam, we guarantee you uh, an associate's degree. And if you do well, we'll pay for your bachelor's too. And I was like, really? Well, what school? They was like, just pass the test. So I never had a problem academically. I was always uh, extremely smart. I grasped concepts very well. So I wasn't worried about being tested in any capacity. Right. So I passed the test and I became a medical biller, like doing coding for medical claims. And they stuck to their word. They paid for my associates. And when it was time for my bachelor's, they said, well, we will only pay for you to go to Queens College. So you got to leave Brooklyn. And that was like leaving the country to me because Brooklyn was like so embedded, like right. everything I know and love. You know, although I speak about how the neighborhood was, the neighborhood also protected me. I, I mean, even to this day, I go home, I feel very safe where right. I am. Right. Uh, the streets took care of me. They protected me. They made sure I was, uh, I was fed and dressed. So the man that said I'll get you to school literally got on the train with me, took me to Kingsborough College, and registered me for college. Mm. The benefit didn't kick in for a semester. Him and his wife paid for the whole first semester and books. Wow. What they didn't know is what they caught me at the right time in my life because I was at a crossroad. I knew the streets very well, and I knew how to make a lot of money in them. Because that's what, what I was taught, and that's the crossroad he caught me at. Wow, wow! Changed my life. Wow, that that's that's awesome. Salute to him, and and Changed salute to you for following through and taking him up on that offer. And he wouldn't back off. Right, he would show up at my apartment. I'm like, why is this? Him, his wife, his kids, like, yo, we having family dinner. Get in the car. Right, right. We never had a family dinner. Right. Like, all of us sit together and talk. Right. Yes, get in the car. <laughs> nah, damn, I was trying to go out of town. Yeah. Like, nah, get in the car. Got you. So, uh, but I had such a high level of respect for him and his involvement in civil rights that I always was very humble to what he said, where normally I'd have been combative. Like, I'm not doing that. You can't make me. You ain't my pops. But no, I was very like. This man paved the way for our whole culture. Right. So I was very humble in that. And everybody in the city knew him. He played chess in the park. Okay, he's he one of those guys. Guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. He would be yeah, in Washington yeah. Square Park playing yeah, chess, and yeah. everybody was like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I had a high level of respect for him. And when it was time for my bachelor's, he literally got a U-Haul truck, packed me up out of Brooklyn, and moved me so that I, and he lived in Queens, and moved me. He's like, no, it's time for you to move. Go get this, go get this bachelor's. And I was so ignorant. I don't, ignorant, I have to well define as just not knowing, right? Ignorant don't mean stupid. It just means you don't know a particular topic. I was so ignorant. I was like, I don't even know why would I go back for two more years when I got what they got in two years. He right. was like, no, you got an associate. Right. Now you're going to get a bachelor's. I didn't even understand. But that was two separate things. Right, right, right. So I went to Queens College and got my bachelor's. And then uh, many years passed. I actually just got my master's four years ago. Mm. So I was working at the Home Depot corporate office here in Atlanta, and I was doing what's called foreign trade zones for them. So there's a, a customs regulations that allow you to import goods into a bonded warehouse and a section or either all of it is considered a foreign trade zone. Okay. Therefore, it's considered physically here, but technically not part of our commerce. Okay. So we don't have to pay duty and taxes on it for three years. Okay. It's a game changer. Mm. Because imagine how much working capital a company can have if they don't pay millions and millions of right. dollars in duties and taxes. Right, right, right. We think duty as travelers. We come back from Jamaica with some white Hennessy. We pay $25 <laughs> yeah, in duty. But no imagine doubt. if you're importing cars, airplanes. Imagine what the duty impact is. It yeah. Make it break your company. Right now during COVID, a lot of small businesses that import, they can't survive because their duty is becoming more than what they're actually profiting. So their return and revenue is just a negative. Mm. So people like me will come in and say, well, I specialize in duty recovery. Mm. And I can get your duty back. Mm. Wow. Uh, if you qualify, of course. Okay. Okay. So I got you. So how does the common, because you, like we talked about, you're well-educated, you have these degrees, right? How does a common person, a common man who's in the trucking industry, maybe he owns a truck or, you know, they have a little bit of uh, knowledge of the business. How do they get into international trade, into global logistics? How do they make that pivot into doing what you do? 
So when you think international trade, think regulations, right? So that comes a little more. You have to understand the logistics before you can understand the law. Mm. So a, a trucker that's an owner operator or even a small 3PL or a small fleet owner, the opportunity is actually endless. It's just getting out of the comfort zone and being able to network. I do a great job kind of put, patting myself on the back or trying to bridge that gap. Uh, because people uh, are only used to dealing with their cultures and they get a little concerned about going outside of that. And I mean international cultures, global cultures. So the first step I tell people all the time is to network. You have to network and you have to not, you have to network fearlessly. You have to network hard, as hard as you go to get your authority, as hard as you go to become an owner operator or get your LLC, you got to go that hard in networking. Uh, so, and it, but it's not that difficult. It's associations, there's memberships. I list them all on my website so that people know where they can be members and associations so that way they can network. And even with COVID, they're having Zoom meetings. They had a whole Zoom Christmas parties for maritime associations. Okay. And there's, there's, they're everywhere. They're okay. not in a small place, they're, they're, especially where the major ports are. So I tell people all the time that the first step is to network, but then also to prepare yourself for the larger bulk freight as well. So I tell people after 9-11, the US government put a lot of effort and resources into securing our borders. So they came up with an, a program called CTPAT. It stands for Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism. Okay. And it's a voluntary program, but I advise truckers to get it all the time because it, it tells, it, it represents your company as, hey, we are here to support your borders. How are you gonna do international trade and global logistics if you're not joining the partnership to protect our borders against terrorism. Right, right. That seems so simplistic, right? Right, for sure. People make it harder than it has to be. And then you need to be available uh, to do port moves. There's customs territories within ports that you can move freight. Why are you not capitalizing on the mo those moves? Those same FTZs, the foreign trade zones and bonded warehouses, freight can be moved from there too. Why are you only focused on the lower board? Right. Uh, I think it just don't know. So I, I give list of associations one and memberships, and they're, they're not expensive. Some of them, some of them are free actually. Okay. Some are like two, three hundred dollars a year, and you just network within those groups, and they're making deals at the Christmas parties. Mm. They're making deals at the Christmas party, like who gonna move my freight at the Chinese New Year from New York port? Right. And you're like, oh, I move freight out of Ohio. If you're willing to now expand your network outside of what you are comfortable doing the business is there right um, and every port is different I tell people that don't think what works for you in the New York port or in Norfolk or in Long Beach is going to apply everywhere each port is different so I tell people focus on the area in which you actually have the equipment to support got you is there any special criteria that you need to have or you need to meet in order to even have these conversations with these people it's knowledge so terminology is a big key. Um, even in the course that I teach, I spend a huge amount of time just teaching terms. There's a dictionary of international trade. Hmm. I promise you. Look it up. It's on my website. Wow. It literally is a dictionary of international trade terms. Hmm. C and can you give us some examples of, right, of some right. of those? Uh, people think broker domestically, right? Freight broker. Okay. What is a freight broker internationally? An international freight forwarder. Right. What do they do? They're securing freight globally. What is an NVOCC? An NVOC is a non-vessel operating common carrier. What do they do? They buy space on aircrafts and on vessels long term. They'll buy the whole front, top deck. So what happens? There's no capacity. There's no space. So everybody's trying to get their cargo moved. What are they going to do? You've got to call the NVOCC, who we would call the middleman. Right. Really? Right. So people don't even understand that that title exists and what their role is. People don't understand what's a licensed customs broker. They think it's the same broker that gets you freight. No, this person actually clears your freight into the country. If you don't have a relationship with a customs broker, you don't know what they're clearing. You don't know what to pick up. Right. 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 For sure. So it's, I mean, because, I mean, it sounds awesome and it sounds like a big opportunity, but I just want to, I want to simplify it for people just so they really understand like what would be the first step or the first thing that they would do, because somebody listening to this is listening, they're like, wow, international trade, that sounds big, right? There's probably a lot of money in this. But the first step is probably, like you said, getting a hold of these lists and making these connections and making these calls and right. saying, hey, I'm a carrier, and I have this amount of- Literally go and join a membership. Okay. Without talking to anyone. Okay. Literally go on these websites, make yourself a member. There's the Society of International Affairs. They do all types of government contracts, but they're trainers. Okay. And they're just a network of people. Okay. Their membership is $300, I think, $300, $325 a year. 
Got you. There's the Atlanta Maritime Association right here in Atlanta. They they are the ones that are discussing freight from Savannah, from Charleston, from Hartsville Jackson Airport. Mm. So the memberships is first. Okay. Because you have to just network. Okay. But those memberships come with a directory. They come with a membership directory. Just like that, you're going to know who's who in the game for your region. Got you. Then you want to go to the events, even now during COVID, even if it means that you're doing Zoom events. Right. Right. Now your name becomes on the directory. Right. Now you can openly call this person and say, hey, I'm a member of the Atlanta Maritime Association, just like you are. I'm interested in moving freight from Savannah. I just moved to Georgia or I have trucks in Georgia. Got you. And Did that starts the whole next level. Do they solicit these opportunities at all, or is it more so you have to go you find them? You need to be in these members. You need to be members. They're not just going to take random calls. Also, the relationships with international freight forwarders. So there's huge 3PLs that are also freight forwarders, like expediters, right? Mm. That's a big, huge company. They have a footprint in every major continent. And what are they doing? They're doing brokerage. They're actually brokering freight on the domestic side. They're clearing freight into the country. They're actually a freight forwarder. They're booking freight on oceans and aircrafts as well. Right. They're, they're members of these same associations. They come to these same conferences. Got you. In terms of like when you start getting into these circles and you start negotiating, you start trying to figure out like price and how do you charge, like that's a whole nother discussion. How do you figure that out? So I teach that too. And that's a little more complicated because uh, bidding for freight and doing uh, what we call RFQs and RFPs is very different international. So you have to have what's called uh, I'll say the basic terminology again. Okay. So there's letters of credit. A letters of credit is literally a document that goes to an international bank that guarantee your payment. I was on Clubhouse the other day with a woman that was in Indonesia asking the truckers one-on-one, -on -one, how do I get paid for three containers worth of product that I moved to, to Taiwan? Mm. And I was in the, in the, in just listening, like, who, how are they going to answer her? Right. So I raised my hand to answer her, and I told her, your customer is not answering you that you sold this freight to because you have a letter of credit at an international bank. She's like, how, how do I know that? So your airway bill, your master bill of lading, just like your domestic bill of lading is a legal binding contract internationally. The international bank that you're doing business with is listed on that airway bill. They're holding your money into the constantly confirmed freight receipt that mm. isn't damaged. There's also INCO terms. INCO terms represents who's liable for freight in every mode of transportation. So if you, if you got a car, if you're shipping cars and it's on a vessel and the whole vessel blow up because the oil leaked from your car or something, who's responsible for that? Whatever's in your INCO terms is in your freight contract. So you have to learn. Uh, so there's no quick way to just say, I'm going to make some phone calls. I'm going to get into this membership. I would recommend people, you take the membership, uh, take the memberships, the networkers. You'll learn just by conversing. Right. Right. Sometimes terminology becomes easy just by having dialogue with people. And then I teach a course, of course, on it to help people understand the terminology. Then I do the introductions. I bring I bridge the gap from people that are on the 3PL side or that are only doing open hours or small fleets. And I introduce them to my network in other countries and see where they can somehow bridge the gap and what it is that they need. Got you. What, what type of margins are you able to make in this business? I mean, people are always interested in the money. Right. So like. Just, just an idea. I mean, obviously, every situation is going to be different. So one, the difference is volume. Right. Right. So right now you move in uh, box trucks or timber or whatever you're moving. Now you got to start thinking that you actually can help move freight from 20 foot, 40 foot and high cube containers from the port. Right. That's 1,800 metric tons worth of freight in most right. cases. Right? right. So now you got a whole different weight class. So... You can actually do drayages. I tell people all the time there's a huge demand for draymen. Where literally go to the port and drop off freight at the rail. You want to be home with your family every day? Mm. People shy away from hazmat. Why? Right. right. You know how much hazmat is sitting there? The Panama Canal went through a huge, for years, a huge um, controversy because the Panama Canal was so small that it could not fit larger ships, which is the a fastest way to get those large ships into the Port of Savannah in Charleston, right? So what did that mean for our economy locally here in Atlanta and in Charleston? We just was not even attractive in some global arenas to even take that freight. Mm. So what happened? There was a huge fight by the administrators right here to say, no, we're going to open up the Panama Canal because we want larger vessels to come here with freight. Gotcha. Because we're losing money right here in the city. It right. took years. The EPA got involved and said, what about the wildlife? What about fish and wildlife? 
eventually it was passed, and it hasn't been that long. It's only been a couple of years. So major freight is now moving through ha through uh, Charleston and Savannah. A lot of it is hazmat. People shy away from hazmat. I don't know. I don't get it. I don't know why. Because <laughs> even if you don't want to drive a truck that has hazardous material in there, what about your back office? Right. Have somebody in your office go get hazmat certified to just placard trucks mm. or sign dangerous good documents, and that's residual income. So when you talk margin, you got to think uh, capacity and how much how much volume we want to move. So if you have the cha chassis, is a huge shortage of chassis in this country. Huge, right, right. huge, huge. And chassis, of course, make you take a different weight class. Right. If you can move a different weight class, your volume increases. So I don't have a distinct number in margins. It's based on what type of equipment you possess or what your mar what you have in your possession to capitalize on larger freight. Because if you don't have the right equipment to take 20, 40 or uh, high cube containers, if you don't have chassis for uh, that 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 uh, that larger, heavier freight, then that's going to be a stump in your growth. Right. Uh, but I think that the margin is endless, actually, as long as you are will willing to roll with the tides quickly and get the um, investment and the capital that you need to invest in your organization to be global. It's re it really is that simplistic. Got you. How has doing international business shifted, like, your perspective of, like, uh, domestic business? <laughs> that's a great question. So... I don't do as much domestic business as I used to, and that's what made me feel like I need to come back home to do, to domestic to uh, try to bridge it. Right. Um, it has shifted my focus because my mind now thinks global economy. My mind thinks GDP and our gross domestic product, right? That's our global economy. My mind now thinks free trade agreements with other countries. We're in the middle of a Chinese trade war. Uh, I have to follow that, of course. So right. that started under the Trump administration, which added an additional 25% of duty to goods originating in China. So I have to now figure out a way to capitalize on that where I can get that money back to people. Right. Um, so it shifted my mind because uh, I, think, I think global, I think international, I think about uh, the transportation of goods and what that means for our global economy. But it's also shifted my mind in a good way because that's when I started to realize that there was a huge gap culturally as well. Mm. Uh, because I'm never going to say that there's not a lot of minor uh, minorities that don't know about this, but that's been my experience that they don't know. Right. And I do business with people of, of all walks of life, life and culture, but I don't see any diversity. People think international, and they automatically think that means, oh, that has to be diverse. It's not. Right. Um, I also make the joke sometimes from the block to the boardroom because <laughs> I'm the only one there. Uh, but it don't have to be like that. Right. So, um, yeah, it's shifted, it's, it has shifted my, perspe my uh, perspective domestically in a, a granular way. Got you, got you. Let's talk about Agate Solutions. Oh, sure. Let, 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 let's talk about what, what you're doing with Agate Solutions. Ex explain, explain that. Sure. So uh, I was recruited for a military defense contractor. And they moved me from Atlanta to Connecticut. And in those negotiations, they said, well, what would it take, right? Because we need someone that can have this level of specialty. And I said, well, I never got my master's degree, right? Okay. So I said, well, I want my master's degree. And I don't even want to see an invoice. I don't want to even look. <laughs> don't even send me an invoice. I don't want tuition reimbursement. Right. And I thought they would never agree to it, but they did. And I started to think then, well, if I could learn uh, labor law, then that will position me to be a CEO. Because I, I was already an expert in the trading of goods and the logistics of the movements, right? Right. But I wanted to understand labor law because I could understand uh, how to make a labor force work. So they actually paid for my master's degree. I was very fortunate for that. I got my master's. And that's how Agate began to be a thought process of how can I stand on my own two feet and be successful in this industry? And... So my first thought was, you know, I don't really know. I really didn't know. I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I knew I had a skill set. I knew I had the strong talent. I knew I had the connections. I had the capital. I just didn't know how I monetized my knowledge. I still work on that, actually. Mm, mm. So, so during COVID, uh, a family member called me and said, hey, um, can you do my resume? And I'm like, do your resume? She's like, yeah. She's worked high-end retail her entire uh, adult life. And I mean high-end, Bloomingdale's, name and markets, and she's been very successful. Right. And she said, well, all, everything's going e-commerce. If I lose my job, what am I going to do? Right. 
I said, okay, send me your resume. I'll, I'll fix it up for you. I'll make it. I'll, I'll jazz it up. Yeah. And she's like, you're good with words. Make it look good. Right, right, right. Hook it up. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I am good with words. I'll fix you. I got you. And then I got the resume, and I was like, how do I tell her she needs a new skill? Mm. Because customer service is her foundation. She can take that and expand in so many areas. But what new talent and skill goes with that to beef it up? So I called her, and I was like, you know, I love you and all that, right? She was like, oh, God, what? I said, you need a new skill, straight up and down. Right. She said, like, what? I said, I don't know. She said, well, what's recession proof? I said, global logistics and international <laughs> trade, your ass will work. <laughs> Never be looking for work. In fact, a recruiter ha a recruiters call me all the time. I haven't looked for a job in probably 15 years. Right, right, so right. So she said, really? So teach me what you do. I said, teach you what I do? I said, what part? She goes, I don't know. It starts from the beginning. I said, are you serious? She said, yeah, teach a bunch of people. We all need to learn this. Right. I said, you think people would want to learn this? She was like, hell yeah. <laughs> so I said, huh. I said, I'm going to build a curriculum. Okay. So I took some time and I started to build a curriculum. I had been teaching this uh, for Corporate America for a long time. So I took some of that material, but I, I was doing it for professionals that already had some knowledge. So now I developed what I call the Shack Breakdown. Okay. Can you, can you get into that? Yeah. So the Shack Breakdown. I love this. The, the Shack, Shack Breakdown Jack. takes all these big words, right? Words like NVOCC, words like international trade. Mm -hmm. Why do we have to call it international trade? It literally says... Hey, I'm going to barter some goods with you. Your country is enriched in oil. My country is enriched in bananas. Let's get a free trade agreement. I'm going to send you some bananas, and you're going to send me some oil, and we good. Right. That's the chef breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You can know better than breakdown. that. Yeah. Right. That's the chef breakdown. What is a raw material? People don't get it. You want to make orange juice in Brooklyn? What you need? Orange juice and water? All right, so we're going to go get us some oranges from South America. All you need is water. Your right. oranges is your, is, your, is your raw material. Right. You add water to it. You got orange juice. That's your wow, finished good. Wow, That's the wow. shack breakdown. That's dope. That's dope. So I, I love that. So I break it down so that way people are not uh, feeling like they're scared of terminology. Right, like you're talking over their head. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're, you're bringing it down to, do to their level and right. making it but simple. But at the same time, you don't walk away not knowing the right type terminology. Right. So I break it down, but you still walk away understanding the key words because you can't have the Shack, shack breakdown with Jackie Chan. Right. <laughs> right. Jackie Chan expects you to say words like international trade, right. EOCC. Right. Right. That's a fact. So you get the Shack breakdown for conceptual concepts to get, walk away with the foundation and fundamentals to understand however you are equipped well equipped to have this type of dialogue and feel confident that what you're saying makes sense so agate solutions provides training so i teach global logistics i teach international trade i teach the course the shack breakdown i also help drivers and owner operators bridge the gap to the international piece not just by networking but i provide them with associations i help them get certified in ctpac uh, a lot of them have warehouses now, and they call me like, I can't get no customers. Mm. I'm like, because you only attractive to domestic. And once you become a, a foreign trade zone, now U.S. Customs is going to advertise for you. They're going to tell the entire international market that you out here with an FTZ looking for freight. Right, right. You're not looking for customers. They come to you because you specialize in something. Right. So I also do consulting. There's a lot of importers that don't have it, that are working towards import licenses. There are companies that need to... I have a compliance program with U.S. Customs. A lot of companies can't sustain right now due to COVID and um, their businesses not making their same revenue. So I, I come in and I either teach them or I go ahead and file documents with customs to get their duties back for them if they qualify. I also pro I provide consulting. I provide mentoring. And my mentoring really doesn't come as a service. I don't consider it like a paid service. I'm really just trying to do that from my heart. That's the social worker in me. Uh, so if you take my class, I automatically am available to you to help connect you with other people. All my instructors are volunteers on my website. They mm. come with an international background. They don't accept a dime. They don't want a dime. Um, I just, you know, I just try to send them what I call law, love offering. Right. Um, they take my students and they answer their questions. They help them find memberships and associations in their area. They help them get certified in what porch they're interested in moving freight from. So Agate Solutions is an education resource. 
It is a mentoring resource. I've been doing re resumes. Didn't expect <laughs> that. Now I've been doing some resumes to help people right. uh, get out there in the job market. I give job listings. I introduce people to the recruiters that are calling me for entry level jobs to help them if they want to get into the job market and expand their knowledge. Um, but the, the core foundation of my organization is consulting. Mm. Are there any spe special opportunities for socially economic disadvantaged people? Yes, so right now I have 67 students in my course. Some of them are actually are free. They came in free. Okay. The course was actually a give back to the community, so it was uh, positioned very low cost. It was only $199. These same classes that I've taken in my career have never cost me less than maybe between three and $5,000 okay. for a six-week course. Uh, so I started it at $199 and make it affordable, but we also had a scholarship uh, fund where I went to some therapy counseling services mm -hmm. and asked them if they had anyone that might be interested in learning a new skill. And the response and the demand was huge. You know, I, I started, I got uh, two domestic violence uh, single moms that okay. lost their jobs and leaving, leaving their husbands and was like, where do I go from here? So as they're transitioning into this independent woman that they have to be now as a mom and a woman that is standing alone outside of a mar uh, an abusive marriage, now they walk away with a skill, a resume, and recruiters. How's the response been from the, the, the people that you've been training? And uh, try to make me mess up my makeup. <laughs> the response has been um, overwhelming because um, I always felt like I had to be a social worker to give back. Because I was a victim of so many things that I won't go through, but I was a victim of so many things in my environment, and I wanted someone to protect me from that. And I thought the only way I can do that for somebody else was to be a social worker. So that was always in my heart. Uh, but what I'm learning with Agate Solution is that the position, the position I am is a position of power because I'm knowledgeable on something that our people generally are not. So I'm in a position to empower somebody else. So... The response has been massive where people feel like it's life changing. And that was not even what I thought it would be. Right. I thought, oh, I'm just going to teach you something. No different than you going to college for a course. Uh, but no, it's been very different. Um, it's impactful. It's life changing. And it's giving people purpose. Wow. Wow. That's dope. Well, Shaquana, this has been an awesome, awesome interview packed with plenty of jewels. I think people are going to watch this over and over again to kind of try to pick up some of these nuggets that you've <laughs> dropped along the way. Um, before you go, we need to definitely get your final thought. I need you to give something to the Hustle fam, just whatever's from your heart. I mean, you've been you've given them so much already, but just one last final thing. And then lastly, just let everybody know where they can connect with you directly and learn more about Agate Solutions. So what I'll, what I'll leave people with last is to understand that if you really want to make an impact on yourself first, uh, you have to be able to be willing to grow your skills to define your future. I think that we're the only culture that makes education seem like, nah, you don't need that. I'm a millionaire. Uh, but whether it's informal or formal education, the ability to learn something really does define your growth. Uh, otherwise, you walk into opportunities blind and you're defenseless. I'm, I'm not defenseless, not because of my degrees, but because I'm educated in something. It could have not have been a degree. Right, but I'm educated in something, and that's what that's what makes my um, my opportunity grow because I've expanded my knowledge in something. So I, I would like to leave people with: uh, don't count yourself out, or don't count out education. The more that you know, definitely does define your future. Um, I can be reached at agatesolutionsusa.com. That is my website. Uh, of course, you can reach me there. Info. Uh, you can also reach me through. I answer my DMs, and I make that a point. I actually <laughs> do answer my DMs, um, and I try to answer them timely because when people come to me, I, I always have them in my mindset. What if they have the same crossroads I was? Right, right. So I try to get to you before you know the left look like it's right. Right. I answer my DMs. I respond to all the inquiries that come in. You can email me straight through my website. You can email me directly at Shaq. It's uh, Shaq at AgateSolutionsUSA.com. No doubt. And I'm glad you said that because there's a big discussion around education and the importance of it, especially nowadays in like the Instagram world. A lot of people will tell you, oh, don't worry, don't go to college, you know, just start a business. Mm -hmm. So, And, you know, you're living proof that, you know, getting that education actually was able to put you ahead Absolutely. and set you up for huge opportunities and put you in a position to where you are uh, like a leadership role to where you can teach other people. And you wouldn't have necessarily known this had you not went and got that ex extra education. And it exposed me to global cultures. Right. I met people from other countries, from exchange students and all that. 
And it it changed the way I was speaking. Yeah. Right. It changed my body language. It For changed sure. me from you know. <laughs> so I can still go on my block and 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 feel very comfortable, right? But then I could also take somebody off my block and introduce them to a connection in a whole other country and make them feel comfortable. Dope. So versatility also comes with education. I'm never gonna knock education. I cheerlead for that all day, every day. For sure, 100. percent I don't think there's no better way to end it, but like that. <laughs> Listen, Shaquana Teasley, thank you so much for joining us today on Truck and Hustle. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Hustle fam, you know how we end it every time. If you smell something burning, it's only your desire, and we are out. Later.